Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good. Great. Well, welcome to today's book talk. My name is Mary Grove, and I'm the director of Google for Entrepreneurs. And it is my privilege to introduce a phenomenal entrepreneur and leader, Steve Case. Steve is the co-founder of America Online, which handled nearly 50% of US internet traffic at its peak. It was also the first ever internet IPO and the top performing stock of the 1990s. Steve is now CEO of the venture capital firm Revolution, which he founded in 2005 to invest in people and ideas that can change the world. Steve also champions this notion of rise of the rest, the concept that innovation is thriving, not just here in Silicon Valley, but all over the country and really all over the world. Steve is a member of the Presidential Ambassadors for Global Entrepreneurship, and he is the chairman of the Case Foundation, which he and his wife, Jean, started together in 1997 to focus on innovation and inclusive entrepreneurship. So Steve, welcome back to Google. Good to be back. It's great to have you back here again. And you have been you know, a long time partner and friend of Google, back from the early days of our, our first search partnership. I was telling Steve over lunch that back in 2004, when I started at Google, we used AIM as our internal uh, chat. Now to Google for Entrepreneurs, we work very closely together with your support for entrepreneurship. And we had a great session this morning at Google for Entrepreneurs, for those of you who weren't there, where there are 11 companies uh, from 11 different you know, cities all participating in a, in a demo day. It was great to show the diversity of talent and ideas you know, all across the country. So thank you for doing that. Why don't you tell everyone about your commitment that you made? So the, the, uh, the idea of these Google demo days, and this is the third one, right? This is uh, the third one. Is to bring uh, the different, different entrepreneurs from different cities and match them up with uh, investors. And so there are about 100 investors in the room from, from obviously this, this area. And hopefully all 11 companies will get investment. Uh, but I, at the end of it, I challenged the investors in the, the room and said, for any company that can raise $1 million in the next 100 days, I'll personally invest $100,000 as part of that. So hopefully all 11 will be able to use that as a way, both within their communities to rally support and also get some uh, support from some of the investors here in, in California. Thank you for doing that. So you wrote a new book, The Third Wave, and I want to dig into the three waves in a moment. But before I do so, I want to rewind a bit to your early days. So you have always been incredibly entrepreneurial. You started, as you said in the book, you started your first business with your brother when you were 10. I think it was Case Enterprises, going door to door, selling. Sounds bigger than it really was. Probably. Selling, uh, <laughs> selling greeting cards door to door in your native Hawaii. And in college, you started six side businesses. So tell me, tell me about what you learned from those experiences, maybe if there was a favorite. Well, I think none of them were particularly successful, but I learned a lot about starting things and, and you know, just the curiosity that I think entrepreneurs bring to, bring to bear and you know, just trying to see new possibilities, new angles. Uh, and so I, I learned a lot. And a lot of it was just you know, the importance of selling in terms of you know, the, the, these businesses that don't work automatically. You have to get somebody to buy something. Uh, and so I, I, there were a lot of times where I'd be you know, kind of going door to door, <laughs> selling stuff and getting the door slammed in my face. And that's always instructive, particularly when you're, you're, you're young. Uh, actually, it was easier when I was really young. I think when I was 10 or 11 and knocking on doors, people kind of took a little pity on me or just wanted to be supportive. So I think my sales you know, kind of track record was early, better when I was really young than I moved into my like, late teen years. And I said, who needs to support this guy? Uh, but it was, yeah, the sales aspect was, was always important. But I got lucky when I, when I was in college in 1980. I read a book by Alvin Toffler called The Third Wave. Uh, that some of you may remember, but it was, it was a, he was a futurist, still, is still alive, so still is a futurist, wrote Future Shock as well. Uh, and the third wave really outlined his a framework to think about you know, kind of what we now think of as the internet. But in 1980, it was viewed as sort of futuristic. Um, but I was completely mesmerized by that, and that led me to, on the path uh, to, to eventually kind of move into the, the, the me digital create world. the first wave, really. You know, just, it, but that, I, I, so when I decided to finally write a book, I deliberately called it you know, the, the third wave because I wanted to kind of pay respect for you know, what the role he played in kind of setting me on, on my path. So the first wave, and I think it's so interesting for, for many of us who work at Google, 
you know, the internet or being connected all the time everywhere is almost a, an assumption. And of course, that wasn't always the case just a brief while ago. So tell us about the first wave era was about building the internet, bringing people online. You say that's roughly from the mid 80s to the year 2000. So what was the key insight that led you to start AOL? Well, the some of it was the, the, to the Toffler vision, but when I graduated in 1980, there were no internet companies to go to. Uh, and frankly, there wasn't much of a startup culture back then as well. So I worked for a couple of big companies, Procter and Gamble and, and PepsiCo, for one for two years, one for one year, but just trying to figure out how to get into this, moved to the DC area in 1983 uh, to join a company that I thought was going to be the next big thing. You know, back then, you know, most of you were not old enough, but a few of you will remember that in 1983, very few people had personal computers, but a lot of people had Atari game machines, and this was a, basically a, a modem that turned the game machine into a, you know, kind of a two-way device. Thought it'd be great. Turned out it was a disaster. Uh, and so immediately, like within a month after joining the company, they laid, laid off 80% of the people. So I was like, ooh, <laughs> like, welcome to the NFL. This startup stuff is going to be a little bit risky. Uh, but two of the people I met there and I went off and started AOL in 1985. But uh, the insight was we wanted to get America online. Uh, and at the time we started, which I know seems crazy, uh, only 3% of people were online. And those 3% were online one hour a week through mostly <laughs> 300 baud modems. Uh, and when they connected on average, they spent about $10 per hour to be connected. So it was you know, the early days. And it was how do, how do we figure out ways to get more people to buy PCs? And how do we convince the PC manufacturers to actually build <laughs> modems into PCs so it wasn't a peripheral device, it was a central device? And how do we re-engineer a network so instead of $10 an hour, it was you know, pennies an hour? And how do we actually figure out ways to get more people online so if you actually did get online, there was stuff to do and people to talk to? Because you know, the early days, it was, it was kind of a, kind of lonely out there. Uh, and so it went from at the beginning of that kind of consumer internet era in the, in the you know, mid 80s to 2000-ish. It went from essentially a concept that nobody knew about or frankly cared about uh, to something that everybody saw the value in and went from nobody connected to essentially everybody you know, connected. So that really was that first 15 years or so. So you became CEO at a very young age. I believe it was 32 or so. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. I actually became I was a co-founder when I was 26 or 7, something like that. Uh, and I became CEO when I was 30, or 30 or 31. Uh, but then we decided to go public. And this was 1992, as, as Mary said, the first internet company to go public. Uh, and there was considerable concern among our board and our venture investors uh, that the public market, institutional investors, probably would be pretty skeptical about the idea of the internet. And so it'd be hard to have a successful IPO. Little age I, I know that seems crazy. Yeah. but uh, And also that uh, it would be harder still if there was this you know, 30-year-old kid as the CEO. So actually, a few months before we went public, I was demoted from CEO to executive vice president. Kind of ticked me off, but I, I you know, sucked it up. And then we went public, and you know, a few months later, I became CEO again, which you know, others have not had that you know, kind of Larry and Sergey and Mark Zuckerberg and others recently. The 20-something the CEO is, is not such a big concern now, but in the, in the 90s, a 30-something you know, CEO you know, was. But, but in fairness, when we went public, we had been at it for seven years, 1985 to 1992. Uh, and after seven years, we had 184,000 subscribers. Uh, and we were generating $30 million of revenue. So in our IPO, we raised $10 million, and the market value was $70 million. And that was more common for IPOs today. Microsoft and, and uh, other, Apple and others we basically went public when they were worth a few hundred million dollars. We were a little on the, on the light side. And so, you know, that, and we did that for seven years. So the institutional investors saying, well, I, I get your pitch about this <laughs> online thing and why people might be interested. But after seven years, only 184,000 people have said yes. So maybe it's just a, a niche market. You know, the good news, obviously, is seven years later, it had gone from 184,000 to like 25 million. And the market value went from $70 million to $160 billion. Uh, so it was the, the second seven years was you know, a little easier than the first you know, seven years. <laughs> you paved the way for a lot of those, those young CEOs now. And I, I, uh... 
I'm always interested in people's track record and what do they do to, to get there. So your second job out of college was at Pizza Hut. And you that had, was a good job. You had probably the best title ever. What was your title? I was Director of New Pizza Development. <laughs> but you are meeting the direct, former director. And what they did was they paid me money to travel around the country and eat pizza. All right. This was actually my job. No, but you, but you wrote in the book that, uh, best title ever, first of all, but you wrote that you learned a lot about portability and convenience. And at the time, you know, pizza delivery, home delivery, the notion of, of calzones, or these things were not right. given. So, and you said that those are two of the attributes that you later really took into account when you were building AOL. So Yeah, the, 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 my first job at p and I, I learned a bunch. Again, I was only there a couple of years. But one of the things they did really quite successfully, they came up with a new product, like a new shampoo or something. They'd put out these free samples and bundle it with newspapers or, or other products to get people to try it. So that, as you might have, you know, some of you might have received a free AOL disk at some point in time. <laughs> that was inspired in part by that, that P&G experience. And some of the, the, the Pizza Hut experience was the, the insight there, which ties in with some of the you know, work we're doing together on the rise of the rest, is that while innovation obviously happens within companies, a lot of innovation happens on the periphery. And P&G was much more of a centralized, kind of top-down kind of organization at the time. It shifted since, but in time, very kind of in, in, in focusing on inventing stuff within the company. Uh, and, and Pizza was sort of the opposite, because it was really run by the franchisees, and the innovation actually happened out in the, on the field, in the periphery. So rather than stay in the headquarters uh, and just try to figure out, like in our Pizza Hut test labs, what the next big thing was, that was the reason to kind of hit the road and find out what was happening and then which of those might make sense for the, for the uh, you know, Pizza Hut system. So, so fast forward, AOL had a meteoric rise from, as you said, 70 million, valued at 70 million to then valued at $163 billion in January of 2000. So talk, let's talk about the merger with Time Warner. And, and you've said that at the time it really made sense for both strategic reasons and financial reasons. As a CEO, what what really pushed it over the edge for you? Because you're doing no, it was, it was well. it obviously it didn't work, and I'll talk about why why it didn't work. But the the logic for it, the you know, the strategic logic was was pretty sound, and then part of it was, as you might imagine, the fact that we'd gone from 70 million to 160 billion, and actually had gone from I think it was 20 billion in uh, two years before the merger to 160 billion two years later. So it really was pretty pretty rapid, and we were a little worried about you know what what might whether that was sustainable, and so emerging with a company that had a lot of other businesses and, and the you know, combined company I think had 40 billion dollars of revenue and 10 billion dollars of profit. Our company alone was about at the time was about five billion of revenue and one billion of profit. Yeah, because of the relative valuations. You know, our shareholders got a majority of the company, even though we were contributing a minority of the revenue and a really small minority of the, of the profit. So there was that diversification kind of play. But also strategically, we knew we needed a you know, path to broadband. We were pretty dominant in narrow band, uh, but needed that path to broadband. And merging with a company with the largest cable systems would be helpful. Merging with a company with a significant media assets on Warner Music and, and uh, Warner Studios and Turner Broadcasting and, and uh, Time Inc. and you know, kind of go down the HBO, going down the list, we thought would also be valuable. And Time Warner needed that path into the, into the digital future. So the idea of it made sense. But the real lesson there was, you know, I, I quote in the book Thomas Edison, who said over 100 years ago, vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> you know, <laughs> having a guy, idea, having a vision, if you will, is important. But ultimately, it's about execution, which ultimately is about people. And, and unfortunately, the company was run as inter different fiefdoms and silos and never really came together. So something like digital music, uh, which, you know, this was the merger was 16 years ago, 15, 16 years ago. Uh, and because we own AOL, which was the leading internet you know, distribution, Time Warner Cable leading cable distribution, broadband distribution, and Warner Music leading music company, how could we not? lead the way in digital music. Well, we didn't. You know, Apple did. Uh, and then the reason Apple did was because they had a real sharp focus on it. And the reason you know, AOL and Time Warner couldn't was because Warner Music and Time Warner Cable and AOL not only weren't working together, they really weren't even talking to each other. They really were run as, as, as independent businesses. So it was a missed opportunity. I was very struck in the book when you talked about the merger. You know, it clearly was a marriage of two very successful but very different organizations, both with, in terms of culture, leadership, what was behind your decision not to uh, continue as CEO? Well, that was sort of pragmatic, because I, I actually uh, knew that getting this merger done would be difficult, 
getting Time Warner to agree would be difficult for a whole host of reasons, and it would be impossible if I had not offered in the first call I made to the CEO of Time Warner to step aside as CEO. So I knew that there were, you know, there, it would, for all kinds of reasons, that the, the, the likelihood of them deciding to do it was low, uh, but the only path would be to say, I'll step aside as, as CEO and, and kind of let you take the lead in running the combined company. So it was a very pragmatic deal-related point. So hindsight is twenty twenty. but would you, going back now, if you could do it all over again, would you still do the merger? I'd still do the merger because I think strategically there still was that logic. I would have you know, been smarter about some of the execution side of things, smarter about some of the, the people side of things. I, I mentioned the book, for example, that not long after the merger I proposed but didn't really have the ability to do it because at that point I wasn't the CEO anymore acquiring Google. You know, at the time, we owned five percent of Google because we did this search deal. Talked about acquiring Apple when Steve it's Jobs went back in, and in and, uh, and there was some. You know, they're still they're still struggling. I think the market value of both Apple and Google at the time was probably a billion dollars, two billion dollars, something like that. Uh, and you know, those were those were things that probably would have made sense. Uh, and so there are some of those kind of you know, missed opportunities. But uh, um, you know, it, it, to me, it was more strategically it made sense. I'm disappointed it didn't work better. I learned a lot of lessons from it that I've tried to reflect in the uh, in, in the book. But I don't really question the core decision because the strategic decision was right. It was the execution that was wrong. But I love the thoughtfulness throughout the book of, of really opening up about these experiences and, and for entrepreneurs what they can learn from your, the path that you paved. So this first era was about the first wave, getting everyone online, building the internet. Now we're at the year 2000. So the second wave you talk about is roughly the next 15 years, so 2000 through to about 2015. And you've called that the era of apps and this concept of dorm room entrepreneurship. So you know, Facebook becoming a global platform, What's been the highlight of the second wave, or walk us through how that unfolded? Well, you guys have been part of it, obviously. Google, where they started at the very end of the first wave, has been one of the dominant, iconic companies of the, of the second wave. So it really is the first wave, if you think about it, just building the internet, building the core foundation technology, building the on ramps, educating people why, why they wanted to get connected. That was really just that first wave. The second wave has just been building apps and services on top of the internet. And it, and, and that has dominated the last you know, 15 years. Obviously, there are all kinds of different things, but the, the center of gravity was, was apps. The fr center of gravity in the first wave was PCs. Center of gravity obviously shifted in the second wave to, to phones. And it, the first wave was more about infrastructure. Second wave was more about apps and, and services. So Google obviously is a, a, an incredible example of that, and, and Facebook and uh, many other examples as well. And they've had, a, obviously, a profound impact on you know, people's lives, you know, global reach. So quite extraordinary what what, what's happened there. What types of second wave companies have you invested in? What's one or two that you're most excited about? Well, we've been focusing most of our investments on what we think of as this as this third wave. Uh, but we've you know, over the last you know, decade, we've invested in a bunch of companies. What in retrospect were pioneers in things that that did, did pretty well in the second wave, but are going to be even more significant in the third wave. For example, 10 or 11 years ago, maybe even 12 years ago, we invested in Zipcar, the first kind of sharing economy company, uh, economy company and then that was later acquired. Uh, so that was an example of something that, that early on we made some investments in, in healthcare. Uh, you know, several companies you know, there. That's an area that I think is going to really accelerate in the in the in the third wave. So let's fast forward to the third wave then, which you've talked about as the internet of everything. Describe to us your vision for what we should expect. Well, actually, in some ways, Google, or more broadly, Alphabet is a great uh, kind of uh, example of this. That a lot of the businesses that Alphabet is now focused on are things that really are perceived to be, I think, correctly, the next big opportunities in, in this in this in this next wave. Whether it really be about you know health or be about cars or what other other kinds of things. But the way I think of it at a, a simplistic level is the third wave is really integrating the internet in more seamless and pervasive and sometimes even invisible ways you know, throughout our lives. Uh, and it, it, some, some of the initiatives that maybe some of you are, are working on, such as uh, smart cities, or how do you reimagine education so it is more personalized and adaptive, or how do you rethink and revolutionize healthcare so you can do a better job of, of understanding you know, how to keep people healthy, how to manage chronic disease, how to manage more you know, life-threatening you know, diseases that, that, as you probably know, that the, you know, because of a data problem, uh, 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 and cancer diagnosis is wrong 
quite frequently. MD Anderson says that 25% that of the time when people come for a second opinion, they reverse the first opinion, which just isn't acceptable. There, there's all kinds of issues now. I think the third cause of death is actually not the actual disease, but, but problems that seep into the, the system uh, in, in, in various you know, kind of ways, which you know, basically are mistakes. And so there's all kinds of opportunities. And that's in the food sector, it's a $5 trillion industry uh, that the, it, you know, hasn't changed that much. I think there's a lot of innovation happening there. And although it's co at the core, it's about the food. There's a lot of things happening with technology and supply chains and you know, using phones to, to order things and other things that are, you know, are going to really change that. Uh, that uh, so the first wave, as I said, was PC. Second wave, phones. Third wave is about sensors and devices and, and, and really kind of infiltrating other parts of our society in ways that can create a lot of benefit, but also are going to create some thornier challenges, including on you know, public policy issues around you know, privacy and, and, and things like that are going to be even tougher. How do you make sure? I'm sure, you know, obviously the folks here that are working on you know, the car effort are, are focused on this, but how do you make sure that autonomous vehicles can, in fact, provide benefits, but they're encrypted in a way that it doesn't create significant risk to cities? And you know, those kind of issues were not as central in the, in the second wave, but they're going to be you know, front and center in the first wave. How to make sure the food is safe? How do you make sure you know, drugs are safe? How do you make sure you know, some of these things in the transportation sector, the energy sector, are, the benefits are, to society are maximized and some of the risks are, are are minimized. So uh, the, the core thesis of the book is that unlike the second wave, uh, it's going to require more partnerships. That, that, that this is less about the app, less about the software, more about how you connect to other you know kind of organizations, whether it be schools or hospitals or cities or what have you. It's going to require more engagement on policy because many of these sectors are are regulated. You might get frustrated by that, but the reality is they're going to be you know, regulated. So you just have to kind of understand that and embrace that. And they're likely going to require more perseverance. I think these are going to be difficult challenges. So there will be fewer of the overnight successes like uh, Facebook or Snapchat, which were pretty, you know, pretty, uh, you know, pretty overnight successy, uh, and more you know, kind of things that are going to take you know, 5, 10, 15 years to you know, you know, kind of a little bit more of a slog. But if you bring that perspective around partnerships and policy and perseverance to bear, you can, you can change the world in pretty profound ways. And the reason I wrote the book was I realized that while, again, it's hard to generalize because a lot of companies are doing a lot of different, different things, but in general, in the, in the second wave, it was more about the app and software. Partnerships were, were, were less important. It, policy was generally not that important, at least until you got really successful. And somebody said, well, what about you know, privacy with Facebook or Google or what have you? Uh, but in the early days, it wasn't, wasn't a big uh, force. And perseverance was less critical because things tend to happen you know, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty quickly. quickly. The first wave really was defined by those three Ps. Partnerships were critical. We, couldn't, we had 300 partnerships at AOL. Policy was critical. Remember, when we first started, it was actually illegal for consumers or businesses to connect to the internet. Illegal until 1991, when the Congress passed the Telecom Act. And also, it's worth remembering that the internet itself was invented by the government. You know, the DARPA funding of that really is what created the, uh, the internet. And the most important, uh, arguably, kind of thing that happened that unleashed the internet, uh, which doesn't get talked about a lot, was when a judge, Judge Green, broke up Ma Bell, the phone company, into regional Bell operating companies. And that created hundreds of telecom companies instead of one, which is what drove down the, the price, drove up the speed, you know, things like that. So there are a lot of things the government did in that, in that uh, sector in the, in, the, in the first wave. So those three Ps were very important in the first wave, not as important generally in the second wave, are going to become more, much more important again in the third wave. So let's talk about those P's. Let's, let's talk about number two, policy on the regulation front. You've talked a lot about how in this third wave it's more critical than ever for companies to get ahead of regulation to work with policymakers. At Google, we feel that uh, you know, every day. So let's talk about Uber. Is Uber, and you talk about this in the book a bit, is it the exception or the norm, how they've well, it's a hybrid. I mean, I think Uber has been obviously a tremendous success, and, and it, it, it's, you know, it, they should be celebrated for taking an idea, what, five, six years ago, and now having such a global presence, such a valuable you know, company. Uh, but I think if people say that the lesson of Uber is to ignore the laws, jump into the market, 
try to get traction and then use that traction and consumer kind of ability to mobilize consumers to change the law, they probably are going to be in trouble in the, in the third wave. For the same reason that Uber is now in trouble in countries like Germany and South Korea where they're shut down. What happened with Uber is sort of a unique you know, case, which is the, the laws were highly localized. So they say they could fight hundreds of battles. They win some, they, they, they lose some. And the basic rules generally were perceived by consumers to be protecting the incumbent taxi companies as opposed to enabling innovation that's good for, for consumers. That's what drove that. There are many sectors that are going to be important in the, in the third wave, you know, like healthcare. If you think you can you know, basically ignore the, the laws around drugs and just offer something you know, without you know, kind, of, kind of going through that process, you are wrong and you, you will you know, be put out of business. Uh, and, and similarly, you know, things around food safety or other, other things around you know, uh, drones or, 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 or autonomous vehicles, things like that, they're going to be regulations that you have to adhere to to be able to be in the market and generate revenue. It's not just about something that you can kind of fight some skirmishes around the, the site. So when I say that, because uh, I've you know, talked to a bunch of people you know, about these, these issues, that, uh, that in this third wave, it's going to require partnerships, which are hard, take time, sometimes frustrating. That's kind of a bummer. You say it's going to require more engagement with policy and dealing with government and regulators. That's kind of a bummer. And if you say it's going to require more perseverance, it's going to just take longer and be a slog. That's kind of a bummer too. And so there are a lot of people who you know, kind of hear this thesis and say, I think I'll stay in the second wave. I think I like apps. I think I don't really want to deal with things that require partnerships. I'd rather go alone. I don't really want to deal with government. I don't want to deal with regulations. I don't want to, I'd like to have overnight successes. Thank you very much. Uh, and some will make that decision. But I think some of the big opportunities uh, are going to, are, are, they're huge opportunities in the third wave, but are going to require this, this different uh, mindset, a little different playbook. As an investor, how much does regulation impact your decisions to invest? So for example, if you were looking at a drone company right, who's dealing with FAA regulations, that there's such a long lead time on, on reform there. Does that influence your decision? How do you think about it? It influences it. We're not you know, naive about some of those risks. And we're not like, rushing to you know, do it to things that are going to be like hard regulatory kind of issues. At the same time, we do believe that's where some of the biggest opportunities are. We do recognize that a lot of investors are run away from those things because of some of the regulatory kind of risks. So as a result, it, it creates you know, pretty interesting opportunities. So it sort of depends on the space. We invested two or three years ago, for example, in company handy that's in some ways like Uber for cleaning your homes and apartments, things like that. And when we did it in you know, sort of a, a two-sided marketplace, we knew there were going to be some you know, policy risk. About how do you deal with these 1099 workers? What, what kind of benefits should they be provided? But that was a risk that we thought was a reasonable kind of risk to take. We how are thought they doing now? They're doing quite well. They're doing quite well. There was a, there was a competitor out here, actually. Uh, I think Google Ventures backed. Homejoy. That, we crushed. We crushed. <laughs> He's an active investor, very proud investor. Uh, There's so still some work you, to do, but Handy, Handy's, yeah, Handy's got good traction. I want to ask you quickly about partnerships. And as you can tell from our own work and the partners in the room today, we, we believe very deeply in that. So can you give me an example of, a, in your mind, just a super successful example of a startup partnering with a major incumbent or large organization? What's the playbook for entrepreneurs? Well, it's actually what Google did with with AOL, even though it happened a bunch of years ago. When when we did this deal, and you know, most of you obviously weren't here at the time, I don't remember how many employees Google had. Two hundred. Two hundred or so. Like that. Uh, yeah, if you talk to you know, Larry or Sergey, I think this might be before Eric joined. Uh, one of the most transformative deals for Google was a deal to essentially have AOL, which at the time was pretty dominant, essentially use Google as, as you know, for search. Uh, and it's, that's why, as part of that deal, AOL essentially acquired 5% of Google at a pretty low you know, value. That actually dramatically accelerated Google's you know, growth, dramatically accelerated the, you know, the algorithm kind of refinement uh, that really helped, helped uh, make Google what Google is, is today. So that's an example where it was sort of a pragmatic decision on both sides, Google saying, 
kind of want that additional distribution and you know, willing to share revenues and willing to kind of you know, give up part of our company to do it. And on the AOL side, we, we did believe that the Google technology was better technology. Uh, and so we replaced what we had. And it was sort of a kind of a, a, a thing that would benefit both companies. And that mindset of in the third wave is going to be much more important. How do you, how do the startups figure out ways to partner with some of the you know, larger incumbents in healthcare or education or some of these other you know, sectors? And how do the large companies figure out ways to understand what the, what the entrepreneur is doing? One of the things I, I really respect about you know, Mary's work and more broadly you know, Google's work is figuring out ways to stay close to the entrepreneurial world and, and understand what's happening on the periphery and try to be positioned as a friend of disruption, not just a, you know, when companies get larger, they tend to shift from being attackers to defenders. Uh, and less about the art of the possible and more about kind of hedging the, you know, the downside. But the really great companies like a Google or Apple or Amazon uh, who in the last decade have really figured out a way to con continue to run their core business effectively while kind of leaning into the future and seizing you know, some of these new opportunities. Great, great. No, so along the lines of entrepreneurship, you and I have talked a lot about failure as a concept that you know, failing, failing quickly, learning from it, something that, that separates great entrepreneurs. So what is, what is your greatest failure, do you consider, and what did you learn from it? Well, I've had a lot, certainly, as I talked to you, know, the failure of the merger with Time Warner would, would, would be one of them. The failure early on to get traction. It really took us a decade before we really got going. I thought it was so obvious when we started that, you know, of course, everybody would, would get online. It took us a, a, you know, a lot of years to finally kind of break through. One of, the, one of the, the really, what we thought was such a devastating failure, it might kill the company, was in the late 80s, I think it was 89. We had a, our strategy in the first few years in the late 80s was to, because we didn't have a lot of capital, we raised $1 million of venture capital to get started, uh, was we partnered with PC manufacturers to create essentially white label services. So we partnered with Commodore, some of you may remember the Commodore 64 to launch a service called Q-Link. We partnered with Radio Shack at the time. We had, had a, a big computer line, to launch something called PC-Link. We partnered with IBM to launch something called Promenade. We partnered with Apple to launch something called Apple Link Personal Edition. It was the first time, I believe, Apple ever licensed their brand name to another company. Uh, and we basically created the service, and they were going to work with us to market it. But not long after we launched it, we kind of had, you know, kind of we're kind of at loggerheads because we wanted to give away the software for free to get membership. They wanted to sell software because that was their model at the time. We wanted to distribute it broadly. They wanted to only distribute it through Apple authorized stores or just a bunch of different issues. So if one day they said, we want out of this deal. We, we're, we're, we don't want to work with you guys. We don't want to partner. We don't want to license our name. And so they basically said they wanted to tear up the contract. And they paid us a few million dollars to kind of go away quietly. And we then had to, we, we thought were, we might be done, because that was a key kind of growth strategy for us. So it was pretty scary. That led us to say, well, we can't call it Apple Inc. anymore. What do we call it? Which led to essentially renaming it America Online. And then that, that plus some other things we did really is what accelerated our growth. So that was an example of something that was a failed partnership that really could have been you know, game over that ended up opening some new doors that, that we were able to you know, pursue. Turn it around. So I'm going to ask you one last question of my own. I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. So please, please get ready. I want to talk about job creation. And throughout the book, you had some really interesting statistics around how entrepreneurs really are the backbone of job creation. I know, Steve, that you did a lot of work leading up to the Jobs Act. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about what do you think the major sources of job creation will be in the third wave? Well, I think it's an important question. I think the, 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 the key, if you look at the data, and there's an organization called the Kauffman Foundation does a lot of research on this, is the big job creation comes from young, high-growth startups. It doesn't come from small businesses, like Main Street restaurants. In aggregate, they account for a lot of jobs, but they don't create a lot of net jobs, because one restaurant might go under, and one might open. In aggregate, it doesn't create jobs. And large companies, the Fortune 500 companies, in aggregate don't create a lot of jobs either. It's these young, what some call gazelle companies. So it is finding the, the, the Googles that are you know, a few people or maybe a few dozen people that might end up being hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of, uh, of, of people. And so that's the key thing to, you know, to, to focus on. And one of the key you know, focuses, and it's one of the things we work with uh, Google for Entrepreneurs on, is this concept of the rise of the rest, that, that we 
I'm sitting in Silicon Valley. I'm, I'm proud of Silicon Valley. I think Silicon Valley will continue to be great, and a lot of great companies will start here and, and, and scale here. But there are also now great entrepreneurs all over the country, indeed all over the, over the world. And in this third wave, I think you'll see both the regionalization and the globalization of entrepreneurship. And that's critically important if we're going to create jobs all across the country and create opportunity and, and even you know, prosperity all across the country. A lot of people do feel frustrated and left out. A lot of cities that feel kind of left behind. And there's a way to bring them into you know, being a more significant force in the, in the third wave than they were generally in the, in the second wave. So that's a you know, big focus of our efforts, both at Revolution and at the Case Foundation. Obviously, it's a key focus for, uh, for Google for Entrepreneurs as well, which is not not to say that we're predicting the decline of Silicon Valley. We're not, but we are predicting the rise of these other places around the, 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 the country, indeed, around the world. And the, and the surprising statistic there, again, I say this you know, knowing that I'm sitting like at Google in Silicon Valley, and sort of like, well, how can you possibly be talking about like the rise of anything other than Silicon Valley, because we're so awesome and do everything so perfectly. But you know, last year, 75% of venture capital, 75% went to three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts, 75%. But that does not reflect the distribution of great entrepreneurs with great ideas. It's really more of a historical anomaly, partly because Silicon Valley done so well, partly because most venture capital is based here, and it's more convenient to get in a car than get on a plane. But that's going to start changing in, in, the, in the third wave, and the rest will start rising in, the, in this third wave. So you want to stay in Silicon Valley, great. It will continue to be great. But if you you know grew up in Detroit and want to be part of the resurgence of Detroit or feel like there's great opportunity to be in you know, Nashville or Madison because of what they're doing, or Baltimore because of what they're doing with you know, health ideas, you know, I think there'll be more of that opportunity in this third wave than there was in the, in the second wave. Just a few examples, just to kind of highlight this, because people, when I first talk about this, well, really? Like, like, are there like real companies in these outside of you know, California, New York, and Massachusetts? How many cities have you been to on the rise of the rest for now? Well, on these bus tours, we've been to 19. And we were started one with, with Mary in Detroit, which is a great story, because 75 years ago, Detroit kind of was Silicon Valley. It was actually the hottest city in the country when the car was the hot technology of the day. It kind of lost its, its way. It's fighting its way back. Uh, and uh, so that was a great place to start. So we've been to a bunch of different, different cities. But here's just a few examples. Uh, hottest health IT company, probably Epic Systems, which is in Madison, Wisconsin. 10,000 employees basically dominate the electronic and medical records business and for hospitals. You know, one of the hottest uh, VR companies backed by over a billion dollars of, of venture capital, including from Google, Magic Leap. Do you know where they are? Florida. Fort Lauderdale, Florida. They're not in Palo Alto. They're not in Boston. They're not in New York City. They're in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Hottest you know, company focused on initially with athletic you know, wear, but then now also focused on health tech, a lot of things around wearables and wellness. Under Armour, worth $25 billion or something. They're in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, there's now a half a dozen you know, multi-billion dollar you know, SaaS companies on one street in Provo, Utah. Uh, uh, Salesforce bought a company for $3 billion called Exact Target that was in Indianapolis, Indiana. So there are plenty of examples of what's happening in different parts of the, of the country. And, and again, we need to continue to support you know, e the ecosystems in this area and other, other areas, but we need to figure out ways to lift up these other places so that there can be more you know, job creation. There. The, 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 the part of the Detroit story I didn't tell you was it was Silicon Valley 75 years ago. It lost 60% of its population in the last half century and then went bankrupt because it kind of lost that kind of job creation engine, kind of lost its entrepreneurial mojo. There are lots of parts of the country that are suffering. That's part of the reason why you know, this election season has been kind of noisy. You know, a lot of people feel frustrated and, and, and left out. And we need to you know, understand that. And we need to make sure entrepreneurs anywhere have a shot. And, Oh, by the way, entrepreneurs that are more diverse have a shot. It's not just a diversity of place, but a diversity of, of background. Last year, 90% of venture capital went to men. 99%, you know, or less than 1% went to people of color. Doesn't seem smart. Doesn't seem right. So how do you make sure that you level the playing field and create, just as the internet essentially democratized access to information, in this third wave, we're democratizing access to opportunity and, and, and entrepreneurship. Well, reading your book makes me incredibly optimistic about the future. I want to open it up for questions from the audience. 
how important do you think uh, entrepreneurship is to education or uh, academia in general? And um, do you think it is an accident that the 75% of the VC capital went to states where we have leading universities that perhaps have a longer tradition in uh, sponsoring um, entrepreneurship? And um, again, can you, what are your thoughts about the, the relationship between uh, universities and entrepreneurship? I think it's important. And, and there's no question that this region benefits from Stanford and Caltech and other things that, that, that are here. No question Boston benefits from MIT and Harvard and, and, uh, uh, and so forth. No, no question about that. But it, it's also true that there are great universities in the rest of the country. You know, the, 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 arguably the best uh, university in the country, probably in the world, uh, around robotics is Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. There's a reason Uber put its driverless car operation in Pittsburgh, not here, because of, of that Pittsburgh's history of making stuff. Again, it kind of led the whole industrial revolution as the steel capital, and and also their expertise, particularly coming out of Carnegie Mellon, around uh, around uh, you know engineering and, and particularly around you know kind of robotics and, and and things like that. And if you go around the country, there are different universities that actually do have you know excellence in, in a lot of different you know, areas, even though. The, the you know what was originally called the mosaic browser for example was i think it was in illinois or you know, it, you know, that was sort of not here not 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 in boston uh, so i think it's a misnomer that you cannot build a significant you know, ecosystem without that you know kind of anchored by a, a research university but it does certainly help and there but there are also places all around the country that have pretty strong you know universities doing some pretty interesting things in some of these sectors last point i make in this third wave sector if you look at things like healthcare and and, and uh, transportation, food, and so forth. 75% of the Fortune 500 companies that lead those sectors are actually in the middle of the country, not on the coast. So if partnerships become more important, I'll bet you there are a lot of ag tech companies in St. Louis. Why? Monsanto is in St. Louis. Tens of thousands of engineers who understand farming. I'll bet there are a couple hundred ag tech startups in that St. Louis area a decade ago. Louisville as well has expertise there. In health IT, I mentioned some of them. Baltimore because of Johns Hopkins, really rocking. Uh, a lot of things happening in, in places like Nashville because there are a lot of healthcare companies, you know, kind of you know, based there. So there, there actually are a lot of activity in each of these sectors. And some of the best, MD Anderson in Texas is probably the leader in, in cancer uh, research, for example. Uh, there's a lot of things happening in a lot of different places, not just here in Boston and, and New York. And that will be more evident in this, in this third wave and more capital will flow there. What's that? It was kind of my point. What advice would you have for those of us working on the rise of the rest outside of the United States, especially in areas that don't have these kinds of staples of histories of uh, other companies or universities kind of holding things together? That's a great question. And, and obviously, Google's doing some work there. We've done some as well. Our focus is most been in the United States, but we did help through the Case Foundation launch a venture capital fund in the West Bank five or six years ago, with backing from Google and Cisco and others with a sense that maybe if you there's startups in like Ramallah, there, there'll be more of a sense there's opportunity there, more, more hope, and that will, might be a way to provide a more Peace, create a more peaceful region there. Done a lot of things in Africa. We were there this past uh, summer. A lot of interesting things happening in you know, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, um, Ghana, uh, and, and developing some interesting momentum around uh, some of those uh, you know, particular challenges in the, some of those regions, huge infrastructure challenges in, in Lagos, but also really innovative things around energy, particularly solar in rural villages in Africa, you know, understanding a problem that we wouldn't appreciate sitting here or most parts of the uh, of the country recently uh, spent some time in Cuba. I think that's going to surprise people as the rules get relaxed to allow more business to be conducted. You know, I think it's going to be rise the great kind of startup you know, nation. But the, the, the playbook is not that dissimilar to the playbook that's being run within the United States because even though it may feel like from other parts of the world, like somehow the United States has it right as sort of this innovative entrepreneurial nation. The reality is it's not evenly dispersed. And the places like Detroit and Nashville and New Orleans and so forth are really fighting to build more network density within their community, more collaboration within their community, try to win you know, this battle for talent, particularly boomerang talent. How do you get people who grew up there, went to school there, to feel like it's time to you know, you know, come back there? How do you get more attention around the companies, drive more capital, which is why the, the Google Demo Day and things like that are, are, are so important. So actually, it's not that dissimilar uh, to the challenges in m most parts of this country. It's how do you just create a sense of 
possibility and momentum uh, and get that kind of network effect work in your favor. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts around um, the types of leader or entrepreneur that might come through the third wave. Is it going to be distinct from the type of leader and entrepreneur that has been successful first, second wave, types of skills, et cetera? Um, is it going to be marked different? It might be. It might be. The, the things, I think time will tell. I would not be surprised if uh, the founding CEOs of, uh, not all, but many of the third wave companies weren't a little older and didn't have a little more domain expertise. Because my guess is if partnerships are more important, having some credibility in that field, whether it be health or education, is probably going to be important. Probably going to be hard to get people to take you seriously at Stanford University or Cleveland Clinic or what have you if you don't, you know, if you don't have some, you know, some, either you or somebody on your team has some of that expertise. You know, the policy regulatory things are sticky and they're complicated and require kind of a, you know, understanding of that. So having some of that, you know, perspective may be important as well. So I think there'll probably be a few less of the 20-something dorm room startups, and there'll probably be uh, a, sort of more diverse teams uh, that really kind of have a broader set of, uh, of, of skills. I'm sure there'll be some exceptions to the rule, uh, but I think the, you know, while the engineering school, the skills, of course, will be important because at the core, a lot of this is about technology. Some of the people skills will probably become more important because those probably are pretty essential in terms of forming partnerships and engaging on policy. Hi, Steve. I have a question around uh, capital. So in a lot of these markets, you have great entrepreneurs, you have great ideas, but we often hear that they don't have the same access to capital, as you mentioned, around the 75%. But it doesn't mean these towns don't have money, right? right? And it doesn't mean that they don't have investors investing in other things. What's your thought around how do we kind of help direct investment towards these entrepreneurs, specifically in this third wave of the type of entrepreneurs that will be created in places like Detroit, um, Nashville, and other places? Well, I think it's several parts to it. And the first part is creating a sense of momentum within the city to get money in the city off the sidelines. Most of these Ride the Rest cities, there's actually a lot of money that could be invested, but they're not really paying attention to what's happening in the startup. And they don't really understand the importance of it. And part of the argument I make when I do these visits is, if you want to have a vibrant community 25 years from now, invest in your startups today. Because there are going to be the, you know, some of them are going to be the job creators of tomorrow. And if you're not investing them today, you're not going to look too good 25 years from now. You, you know, so it, it's sort of as a, they're good investment opportunities, and that should be a, a driver there. Some of these successes I mentioned, like Epic and Under Armour, people early invest made a lot of money. But also, it's a way to kind of, you know, kind of strengthen your community. So, get mobilizing local money, I think, is important because obviously, national investors are looking for that local signal of like nobody in Des Moines investing in the company. Why should I in San Francisco or New York or D.C. or wherever invest in it? So that's one. Crowdfunding is another. One of the reasons I was a pretty strong advocate for this Jobs Act that passed a few years ago, jumpstarting our business startups, because I think crowdfunding can be a, a game changer and it can level the playing field because a lot of people don't have money and don't know people who have money. Uh, and uh, the project sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo have demonstrated that the, it's more about the idea and less about what you look like and who do you know. And so as that shifts, and it's going to take a number of years to also allow equity and debt crowdfunding, I think that's going to open up a lot of opportunities for a lot of people in a lot of places that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't uh, have it. And the third is to, like we're doing today with the Google Demo Day, educate investors in places like California, New York, and Massachusetts, where most of the money is, that there actually are great opportunities there. And oh, by the way, because there's less investors paying attention, the valuation of that company in Des Moines or New Orleans is less than that, that same company was in Palo Alto or, or Manhattan. Yet if it's successful and goes public or gets acquired, it gets acquired at retail, but you can invest and rise the rest cities at wholesale. So essentially, there's an arbitrage opportunity. So it gets more investors to pay attention and you know, kind of get on planes. So it's some mix of mobilizing local support, kind of using crowdfunding as a platform to, to kind of create, you know, use the internet to raise capital for more people with more more ideas and more places, and then you know it'll take some time, but try to you know, create more momentum around you know what's happening in the in the rest of the country. My guess is ten years from now, all the leading venture firms will have regional strategies. They'll call it different things. They'll 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 organize it differently. But the the days of their basically saying, which some still do, that I'm only going to invest in companies I can drive to, will be viewed as you know, kind of a relic of history and 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 not even result in a lot of missed opportunities. Even though I love Silicon Valley and still think Silicon Valley would be great. I'll make that clear. And I'd like to close with just a quick, rapid fire fill in the blank for you, Steve. So I'm going to say a phrase or 
statement. I'm going to ask. It's like a Rorschach White. test. I hate this. <laughs> My first AOL instant messenger screen name was Steve. <laughs> Just Steve. Hey, it pays to be early. <laughs> one one startup you should all go check out right now is. That's a good question. What's that? Mati. Mati, yeah. Mati was a company that won last year, Google for Entrepreneurs in, in, in North Carolina. And, there, and if you want to drink it, it's right back there. <laughs> no, I, I, it'd be hard to, you know, we were championing dozens of cities and really thousands of entrepreneurs. It'd be like picking your favorite child. So I would say, you know, my, my, my favorite is actually, you know, just understanding what's happening in this third wave and why it'll be different, understanding kind of why it will likely happen in places and pay attention to what's happening and try to be supportive of these rise of rest cities. The best pizza I developed as director of new pizza development was? <laughs> well, I, didn't, I was only there about a year, but the, the key, the key, uh, pizza in that year. The, uh, we didn't really, we tried a bunch of things. I'm not sure any of them actually got much traction, but as you mentioned earlier, the delivery was one of the things that was, at the time, very few you know, places delivered, and that was a, a big focus that then obviously did get traction. Now everybody delivers. Final question. My advice for all of you as Googlers. I think you're doing remarkably well. So I'd start with, I'd start with that point. I think trying to figure out how to maintain this culture of being an attacker, as I said before, is critically important. I think actually the, the structure on Alphabet seems logical to me to kind of create that, you know, that di kind of dynamic. The, the challenge there, a little bit like I was saying with, with the Time Warner situation, is make sure as things become more separate that you don't have the ability still to drive some synergy and collaboration where it makes sense. And some of these things, it's not going to be as necessary, but where it makes sense, how do you continue to, you know, to drive that? And how do you, you know, recognize that, that you know, things are going to continue to change and, and not have this you know, mentality, particularly in your group, where you get you know, cocky or complacent and you know, continue to you know, kind of push ahead? And you know, pay it forward a little bit. You know, kind of the, how do you, this is a company that, that has benefited greatly from the support of a lot of people. How do you, in whatever sector you care about, whatever place you care about, how do you be helpful as well? And maybe that's even if you're still going to stay at Google and still going to be living in this area, maybe there's a way through crowdfunding or you know visiting once a year to you know place you grew up or the place you went to school and be part of helping other entrepreneurs in other places and part of of this kind of rise of the you know the rest uh, movement. It's not just about what you're doing directly; it's about the impact you can have broadly. And because of the success of Google and the respect of, of Google, that you know you as an ambassador, you know I think could really be you know, transformative. So I just encourage you to you know, think about that as a way to have impact in the world beyond what you're doing you know, day to day, uh, because that ultimately will lift up more entrepreneurs in more places, and that ultimately will result in a, you know, a, a fairer and, and more prosperous uh, world. Steve Case, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for coming. Today.